Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I'm asking questions submitted by listeners of the podcast to the director of the Center for Health Security at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Dr. Tom Inglesby. Let's listen. Dr. Inglesby, thank you so much for everything you're doing uh, with respect to the coronavirus outbreak and for joining me today. Good to be with you, Josh. So um, we have a bunch of questions that have come in uh, from uh, all quarters. I'm just going to ask you a bunch of them. First one is, what have we learned about the coronavirus in the last several days that's new and important? So, yeah, Chinese studies keep getting um, put online, which is great. And there are some studies coming from different parts of the world. One thing that we've learned in the last couple of days is that there does appear to be uh, pretty, pretty substantial pre-symptomatic transmission that's gone on in uh, studies in China. Um, So that does make the possibility of interventions more complicated. If people are spreading the disease before they're symptomatic, that makes things more complicated, or at least a portion of them are. Um, We've also seen in one study that when you really do good contact tracing, after you find a case of COVID and and you really investigate that person's contacts, we do see that children are being infected uh, in the same kind of distribution as others are, other age groups, they're just not symptomatic. So unless you were really carefully doing contact tracing, you would miss those kids and you might have the impression that kids aren't just getting infected. It does appear, at least in this study, that kids are getting infected. They just have minimal symptoms. So the good news continues to be, at least so far, there have been no reports that have come out that say that kids are getting severe illness in high numbers but it does appear that kids are getting infected in the same way that other age groups are getting infected. Got it. Um, well, that relates to a little bit to this, my next question, which is once coronavirus begins to transmit in a city, is the rapid spread inevitable? Is it, you know, for example, because of asymptomatic transmission or other, um, other characteristics of the virus, is it just a matter of math to see the cases increasing? So we've had two things that would argue uh, that the answer to that is no. Um, but on the just let's just back up a little bit. It, it does appear that the disease is spreading, possibly in an exponential way in many countries. That is to say, doubling after a week in many places. Part of that it, it's hard to tell because we're just catching up on diagnostic testing. So you know we're, we really haven't done enough diagnostic testing to know what the real prevalence is in many places in the most places in the world. But we have two studies that are useful to your question. One is uh, one that's probably going to come out this week, which looks at the experience of Wuhan versus Guangzhou in China in January and February. And it shows those are similarly sized big cities in China. And it shows that in Guangzhou, uh, where they took fairly strict disease control measures early on, the number of hospitalized patients remained relatively low. Uh, the number of patients needing ventilators was relatively low. But in Wuhan, where disease containment measures were delayed for about a month, we saw very high hospital spread, or rather very high spread and hospital burdens, and very high burdens on the intensive care unit in that city which didn't really come fully to a peak until three weeks after strict disease containment measures had been put in place. So that argues uh, for the value of 
social distancing and disease containment measures. We can talk later about which ones, but... Actually, why don't we talk now about which ones, because that's the next yeah. question that, that a lot of people have, which is how to think about these measures, which we're starting to see now uh, a little bit more in the United States, like saying we don't want gatherings over a certain number of people or universities sending students home, um, as well as even shutting down schools. Um, in some areas, how, how do you think about those now? Yeah, no, I think what we are seeing is that there is evidence in China, which we just talked about, of those measures being valuable um, together, taken together. And it is difficult to kind of separate out which measure has made the most difference. We don't have that kind of evidence or historical data to know that. But we also know that, for example, in South Korea, uh, they have really put into place um, pretty substantial social distancing measures. They have not locked down their cities in the way that China has, but they've done other things to try and the other things that we talked about, cancellation of gatherings, telecommuting, closed schools, and taken together, those measures also seem to have had a very positive effect on the rate of spread in South Korea at this point. These are still early interventions, so we don't know. Um, but I do think that um, there is, I mean, there's basically pragmatic observation when you when you decrease social interaction in a community there's going to be less opportunities for a disease to spread so even though we don't have a lot of historical data we do think that slowing down social interaction by people staying home when they're obviously staying home when they're sick also kind of diminishing the you know look very high volume gatherings in the city uh, and considering things like school closures they make sense the, de the devil is in the detail because each one of these has a very, very strong societal downside. People will lose jobs, uh, probably, or at least temporarily, you know, economic hardship uh, with some of these measures. And if we close schools, there are uh, many kids who depend on schools for meals and um, and for care when their parents are at work, either two parent working families or single parent working families. So these are not going to be easy decisions. But I think there is enough initial evidence in China and South Korea that they can make a difference taken together that they should be seriously considered. Great. And just focusing a bit on school closures, people have expressed a concern that it may make it harder for people to get to work, which could be important for the healthcare response. You know, what's the state of the discussion around that? What are the different uh, perspectives? I think that that is definitely true, that it will make, if we close schools, there will be many parents who will be in a difficult situation and have, have trouble getting to their jobs, whether it's in healthcare or some other important thing for the city. There's lots of important industries and things and going on that depend on workers. I think the, the argument for closing schools is that we do see that there is transmission going on in kids. Uh, it, kids... If kids bring it home, we're not wor worried so much that kids are going to have severe illness, but that they bring it home to their parents or to their grandparents and that they will be a driver for transmission. And so, I mean, one thing that people are beginning to talk about is whether there are nuanced positions that that's, the communities can come to. That is to say, maybe some schools can close. Others are going to have more challenge because of kids relying on the safety net that the school provides. If that's the case, is the school able to provide the safety net in some other way other than traditional teaching? Right. Um, people are beginning to think about those things. None of them are easy. They're going to need really close connections with the Department of Education and the Department of Health, which doesn't do schooling on a normal day. Got it. Um, let's switch gears. A uh, mm -hmm. number of questions about the rumor that this might have been created in a Chinese lab of some kind. Um, what is your response to that? Uh, at this point, there is no genetic evidence of anything other than a natural, naturally occurring virus. It is true that there is a major laboratory in Wuhan that studies coronaviruses and that has a large collection of coronaviruses. But the analyses that have been done and the, I mean, the virus has, the sequence of the virus has been published and the Many different viruses have now been published from cases around the world. There isn't any evidence that this virus has been engineered or is different from something that would be found in nature. Thank you. Um, one question uh, has to do with 
immunity and reinfection. There's some reports that people might get reinfected. Anything that you would want to say about questions about whether people can get this disease twice? Yeah, well, well, I think some of that is kind of this uh, observation that there have been some people who had a positive test and then they became negative and then they became positive again. And those have been relatively, those are small kind of anecdotes. And in my own view, and I think what others would also say is that that probably is more of a factor of testing and the characteristics of the test that maybe it's a false negative or is only, you know, it was basically just below threshold. I don't think those those cases represent any kind of like, you know, rapid reinfection or, you know, kind of being negative than being true positive again. Got it. I think for um, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, no, no, why don't you finish? I was just going to say that the idea, though, that whether or not someone could be reinfected later the next year with this virus, I don't think we know the answer to that. For other coronaviruses, people can be reinfected, um, <clears throat> but it, for, for most infectious diseases, there is some kind of durable immunity that's created after serious infection. So I think it's too soon to say. We're hopeful that there'd be some protection against reinfection from um, actually getting the disease, but I don't think we know yet. Thank you. Um, is it true that the virus affects more men than women? And if so, why would that be? Yes. From studies in China, it looks like there are men, more men than women who are infected. We don't really know yet why that would be, whether it's underlying medical conditions, whether men are more in positions in the community where they're in places where they might be at higher risk of transmission. I think it's too soon to say, and not every study is consistent but there are more studies showing men than women. So I think it's, it seems to be a true phenomenon, but it's not dramatically different. I don't think it's some, it's not 60, 40. Uh, it's closer to a few, a few percent above 50. Got it. The studies that have come out so far. A um, few questions that kind of take us inside people's houses. What is self quarantine? If someone's told to self quarantine, they've just been exposed to the virus. They're not sick. What should they be doing? What, what does that actually mean? I think in general, they should just follow the advice of the public health authority that uh, directed them to self-quarantine. But in general, that will mean staying in your house, not interacting with others, having your own, if possible, uh, not always possible, but if possible, having your own bedroom and not sharing a bathroom while you go through the incubation period of two weeks. There's not a lot of, you know, again, not a lot of historical precedent for this or a lot of case studies that show us exactly how to do this. But I think it's kind of common sense avoidance of interacting with others in close contact for about the, the duration of the incubation period, which is 14 days. Now, what about people who um, are just not feeling well? It could be some other condition, but they're playing it safe, like they're being asked to, they're staying home, um, and then they feel better. How long should they wait before returning to work? I think that's more complicated for the next week or two. Um, it's it's difficult to know because we don't have ready diagnostic testing available. Hopefully, what I would say is people, if they feel, if they have recovered and they no longer have cough or fever, then they're, most public health people would say you could go back to work. Um, it seems like uh, people do clear virus during their infection. The studies that we've seen so far is that you don't have virus shedding for weeks after the infection, but while you're sick, um, we don't know the, the precise detail for each person, and there will be some variety, but I think a general measure would be when you are clinically better, that is probably a safe time for you to go back to work. And for these people who don't even know whether they have disease, um, right. and the likelihood is pretty low right now for the average person around the country that a cough or fever does represent coronavirus, it's safe, it's prudent to stay home for now while we're still getting diagnostic testing expanding stay home while you're sick. Hopefully in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, we'll get to a point where people with cough and fever can get a test to, to see if they have coronavirus. But in the meantime, stay home, stay out of circulation, don't go back to work until you're well. And that's a pretty good measure of people's potential effectiveness. Uh, great. Um, here's a question about people who do at the moment have cough and fever and are not feeling well. Um, when should they seek medical help? I think they should um, see if it's possible to get a diagnostic test at this point. It's beginning to be possible around the country for people with cough and fever to get testing. It, it may be that in their own state, 
someone says there's just no way you can't get that where we only have testing for the sickest people and that is what it is if that's the answer then that's the answer and people should just stay home and then of course if they get sick enough that they are short of breath or can't keep fluids down uh or feeling uh absolutely terrible then they should call their doctor and tell them that they're sick and talk about where they could get seen for help. Um, so they shouldn't be sitting at home feeling short of breath or, or in any kind of dangerous medical condition. Um, they need to get medical help. And just thank you. And just to circle back on the diagnostic test question, um, yep. you're not recommending that people just show up in the emergency room and ask for a test, though. It's no, more like right. You need right. If you're going to get tested, you got to call your doctor. You got to figure out what the process would be, and you should. Every person who gets tested should be announced ahead of time. People need to be ready for that test because we want to make sure the healthcare workers that are involved in the testing don't themselves get infected in the process of testing. And at this point, it's most likely that most states would say, unless you're very sick, we don't have the ability to test you just yet. But in the next week or two or three or four, depending on where you live, there are some of the biggest clinical diagnostic companies in the country are now getting involved with testing. And it may make it possible for us to get testing on people who have milder symptoms. And I think at that point, we should. Got it. Um, one question is about uh, families and households that have children and older adults in them. Uh, at what point does it make sense to limit interactions between them because of the novel coronavirus? I, I, I would say in most places where the disease there's very little disease diagnosed. It's probably not today, but it's coming soon. Um, I think uh, we just need to really be careful about uh, protecting our older family members and, and friends who are at the highest risk. There hasn't been any kind of recommendation from CDC or any other public health agency yet about really formally staying apart, but that is something that we should begin to be thinking about Certainly when there's evidence that there's been any um, infections in schools, we would, should assume that disease has been moving around the pediatric population and kids. And I think at that point, really, to the extent that it's possible in any household for older people to at least do what they can to try and not have close interaction with the young people in the house, that would be safest. Great. Um, one last question. You know, we look around the world and we see some areas that are very heavily affected and some areas and cities that have not been so heavily affected, even though it's in, in the vicinity. Um, you know, how are there a lot of people who are anxious for their own area um, that it become one of the places that's not heavily affected? Um, what is it that people can be doing now? I think on an, it's basically the collective action that we all take to slow it down. Um, there's no single one thing that will help us prevent it from going into a, a typical place. But as we saw in South Korea and we saw in Guangzhou, that if we do decrease our intense social interaction as we're coming to grips and understanding where this virus is, then there are it, 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 we have at least some early evidence that those measures collectively will slow the spread. It's not to say that we will prevent it from getting into a particular city or country. We don't. There is no evidence that anything we're doing is going to do that. But once it gets into a place, our our collective behaviors individually, and then our our policies about schools and gatherings and businesses, we think that though, taken together, those things could make a difference to slow things down. Thank you very much, Dr. Inglesby, for joining me today to answer these questions. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.